Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. This program is being taped in Washington, D.C. And I have a distinguished Louisianian whose base was Washington, D.C., but whose playing field was the entire world. He is Ambassador Robert Bigger Oakley, who's a retired career member of the Senior Foreign Service and whose last post was Ambassador to Somali Democratic Republic. Ambassador Oakley, welcome to Louisiana Legends. Thank you very much. Sir, it all began for you in Shreveport, Louisiana. That's a far piece from Somali, as we might say, in Louisiana. Tell me about those early years growing up in Shreveport. Well, those were wonderful years. Uh, we moved to Shreveport from Dallas when I was three years old in 1934, and uh, uh, I grew up in South Highlands, had a neighborhood gang that included uh, Bennett Johnson, and we've been very good friends ever since, and uh, still have a lot of those friends. Uh, we had a weekend at the beach uh, with some of them uh, here just 10 days ago, so uh, my Shreveport contacts are very much alive, and I still, still consider Shreveport to be really my home. And you recently returned to Shreveport for a sad but wonderful occasion at the same time. That's right. My mother died. Uh, she, for 60 years, was a leading Shreveporter. She was involved in all sorts of civic causes there. She uh, and two of her friends had the first all-women's real estate firm. She was the first woman elected to the real estate uh, board in Bossier, Shreveport. And uh, she helped found Holy Cross Church and did a lot of things in Shreveport uh, that people are very appreciative of, but had lots and lots of friends. And uh, we had a wonderful memorial service there for her at the First Presbyterian Church just uh, two months ago. Sir, uh, what high school did you attend in Shreveport? I went to uh, Southfield School, which is a private school. Uh, enjoyed it very much. Uh, a lot of my buddies went on from there to Bird. Uh, I went off to secondary school up in Connecticut, which led me to uh, Princeton University. Go ahead, Trace, then your educational uh, and, uh, life. After Princeton was right at the end of the Korean War, and I decided to join the Navy and go off to Officers Candidate School rather than be drafted, and I was sent to Japan in Naval Intelligence, where I stayed for two and a half years, and that gave me an interest in things abroad, and I came back home. wasn't quite sure what I wanted to do, and uh, so I went to graduate school at Tulane for a year and a half, uh, working on history, and enjoyed that tremendously eventually decided to go into the Foreign Service in the State Department. Ambassador Oakley, that, that was a kind of an exotic decision, even with your background, educational background, Princeton and so on. What, what do you think it was about the Foreign Service that, that, that attracted you? Well, to tell you the truth, uh, I wasn't 100% sure. My wife, on the other hand, uh, wanted to do this ever since she was in college. Uh, I didn't have very clear idea of what I wanted to do, but uh, spending a two and a half years in Japan made me decide I wanted to do something having to do with foreign countries. I talked to some businesses and they said, well, you don't have any real specialty. And I went around and talked to the CIA. That didn't interest me at all. And uh, finally I said, well, I'll take the foreign service examination. And I did. And uh, I've been very, very happy with it. I've been in lots of different places in different parts of the world. None of it's been dull. Where was your first posting overseas? My first post overseas was Khartoum, Sudan, and uh, I had been in French language training in Nice, uh, France, and expected that I would be to Western Europe and maybe back to Washington. And my fiance and I were decided to get married, and uh, all of a sudden I was sent to Khartoum. And they called me one night and said, "Get on the plane tomorrow." This is when I was in Nice, and said, "Go." And so then we said, well, "What are we going to do?" Because there's uh, not enough time in those days. Uh, we didn't have all the rapid transportation. I just couldn't get enough time off to get back to uh, the States to get married. And so we decided we'd be married in Cairo, where we had a couple of friends, and it was a little bit larger than uh, Khartoum, better for a honeymoon. <laughs> and so uh, my father-in-law gave my fiance a one-way ticket to, <laughs> to Cairo and said, I hope that your uh, husband-to-be is there to meet you, because this is it. Good uh, luck. <laughs> And you were married then in Cairo. Where did you meet the Mrs. Oakley, Mr. Ambassador? She and I met at the Foreign Service Institute. She was also a diplomat, and uh, after having resigned, forced to resign when we got married in 1958, because the rules then were that 
married women could not be in the diplomatic service uh, because they couldn't keep their minds on the job. Uh, <laughs> after 16 years, uh, they changed the rules and she came back and uh, she's still on active duty. She's the Assistant Secretary of State for uh, Population, Refugees and Migration. And she says three growth industries. <laughs> but uh, we were married in Cairo. Uh, they had a big send off from St. Louis, uh, which is her hometown. and. Uh, all the people there thought she was going to Cairo, Illinois, uh, <laughs> not Cairo, Egypt, and she had to keep correcting them. But uh, we went, uh, then she came with me to uh, Khartoum, and that was our first post. Sir, how tough is, and, and this is a question that always fascinates me, and I probably ask you too much, how tough is that kind of life, particularly those incredible periods of separation, how tough is that on a marriage and a family? Well. It is tough. Uh, it's like the military, which is tough also. But uh, if you've got a good, loving relationship, uh, you can make it. Uh, it's tougher, I think, on the children than it is on the man and the wife, uh, quite frankly, because they have to pull up their roots every two or three years. As our daughter said uh, one year, I can't remember where we were, she said to uh, our mother, said, you know, Mom, don't worry too much about the fact our grades aren't too good. We always do better the second year. <laughs> sort of, but you lose all your friends and, uh, you know, when you're in the Foreign Service, you just go on and make new friends, but uh, it's tough for the children especially. You mentioned that uh, when you were looking around for a career, that uh, you looked into the CIA but absolutely did not want it. Mm -hmm. May I ask what did not appeal to you in, in, in the CIA? Well, I felt, obviously it's something you have to have, but uh, it wasn't something that I felt I would be really very, very well suited for. Uh, I just don't like the idea of exploiting people. And that's what you have to do in the spy business. Mr. Ambassador, you had, I, I'm quoting from some biographical material that we uh, got on you. You're known for bluntness that we don't normally associate with diplomacy, A. And B, most of your posts have been trouble spots rather than glamour posts. Mm -hmm. Nobody ever wanted you to go to a wine opening uh, a tasting, but they wanted to send you to these, excuse the expression, the hellish spots all over the face of the earth. What was your first tough one? Well, Khartoum was uh, tough in a sense, uh, particularly since I didn't know what I was doing, uh, because I was sent down there. It turned out to be what they call the general services officer, took care of all the maintenance, uh, leaking toilets, uh, air conditioners, uh, <laughs> Finding uh, <laughs> places, uh, renting places to live, renting offices, spaces, uh, running the motor pool, the uh, whole works, uh, and they never had one before. And we were supposed to support an aid mission, uh, which was supposed to have 15 people. By the end of the first year, they had 100. And uh, well, I think we tripled the rents in Khartoum just by ourselves, and the, the big bad Americans came in, and uh, that had a backlash because there were too many Americans spending too much money without any visible benefit to the local people. I see. So we sometimes do that without understanding it, uh, the best of intentions. We sometimes make a negative impact. Uh, Thus become the ugly American. That's right. That's right. Sir, uh, after that, it sounded like a rather horrendous start. I mean, the duties that you had to perform. Did you consider maybe chucking it and, and, and going into something else? No, I didn't concede ch consider chucking it. I just considered working harder at it. And uh, Eventually, I shifted over to the political section in Khartoum, which I found much more to my liking. And there were a lot of young people who just come back because the country was in its second year of independence, and uh, people were coming back, uh, just the elite, if you will, from Oxford and Cambridge, and they thought they could make something out of the country. Unfortunately, uh, it hadn't worked out that way, but it was an exciting, interesting period. Then we went back to Washington to uh, the Office of UN Political Affairs. My first assignment there was supporting uh, what was going on in the Congo. And that was a very, very interesting time because the United States and the Russians were tangling in the middle of Africa at that stage. And uh, as you recall, eventually the Secretary General of the United Nations, Mr. Hammarskjöld, died in a plane crash out there. Yes. And uh, to my surprise, since I was sort of the backup, uh, one day a bill from the Pentagon landed on my desk for the expenses for his plane. <laughs> and sent over in my name for about a million dollars. I didn't know quite what to do, but eventually the State Department paid for it. I didn't have to pay for it. But, uh, Sir, uh, this is uh, very fascinating to me. Now, how shall I put this delicately? You've been thrown out of some places by the leaders of countries. For example, Zaire's president ordered you to leave Kinshasa. Somalia's despot ejected you as ambassador in 1984. 
what is Robert Oakley doing that these people want to get rid of him? <laughs> well, as you pointed out in the very beginning, I'm quite blunt, uh, but let me make two minor uh, points here. One is that neither Mobutu uh, nor Siad Bari actually succeeded in getting rid of me. Uh, Mobutu uh, sent his intelligence chief back to Washington to talk to Mr. Casey about getting me out of there and talked to Gene Kirkpatrick and said, this guy's got to go because he's a Carter human rights holdover. And the problem was we were having a considerable fight with him because he was diverting uh, something like three or four hundred million dollars a year into his own coffers, and it was money that the United States was in part putting up through the World Bank and the IMF and other things, as well as our direct aid program, and I was on his back about that, for sure. But strangely enough, the word came back in the person of General Walters uh, from the president saying, no, he's going to stay. And Walters told me that Mobutu broke down in tears and said, do I have to keep him forever? I got rid of two previous ambassadors just by saying I wanted them out of there. And they said, no, he's doing what he's being told to do. Therefore, the problem is not Oakley. The problem is with you. Uh, but after about six months, it was time for me to leave after three years, so I left. But then with Siad Barre, uh, another dictator, uh, he really was. Uh, after two years, I was called back to head the Office of Counterterrorism. And Senator Nancy Kostenbaum met me about a year and a half later and said, you know, I just was in... Somalia, and Siad Barre says he misses you. I said, why is that, since we fought the whole time? He said, because since you left, nobody tells him the truth. <laughs> Sir, uh... And I think that's part of it, quite frankly. Uh, people do appreciate advice, if they have any sense, uh, even if it's a little bit blunt. Tell us some trade secrets in this respect. How straight does an ambassador talk to the head of a country when they're alone? D do those niceties that you have to have in public, at least, can you get pretty straight with a person in, in private if you're the ambassador? I always have been. And yeah. I say sometimes uh, there's a little bit of resentment, uh, but in the long run, as I was suggesting with Mr. Siad Barre, they seem to appreciate it. Uh, even though they may not necessarily do what you want, they prefer to know where they stand uh, rather than shilly-shallying around, and I've never believed in that. And uh, sometimes I've watched the United States uh, about policy or the action of individual mislead leaders of other countries. And that, I think, is not good for them or for us. Uh, one does it sort of the spirit of get along and go along, but uh, in the long run, it's not the right thing to do because it's bad for them. They misjudge us, and then we, in turn, become very, very critical and have to clamp down on them. And uh, much better to get it out in the open and quiet, not out in the open, but uh, in the sort of talks you're suggesting uh, directly with the chief of state uh, in private and say, here's the situation, here's what you're going to face two or three or four years from now, therefore uh, you better make your calculations before it's too late. Have you ever had to tell a man that he was diverting his uh, uh, monies uh, to his private coffers? Have you oh, ever yeah. Had? I went through that with Mobutu, uh, and it was very amusing because a real confrontation came right after the presidential elections, and uh, President Reagan was elected, and Mobutu desperately wanted to come to the United States. And so, uh, they sent General Walters out with a little letter saying, if you want to come to the United States, here are the things you've got to do, which meant uh, putting World Bank watchdogs in the big copper industry and putting uh, IMF watchdogs in the central bank. And even with that, uh, he still found a way to divert money later on. That's where he and I had a major showdown. Uh, sir. He's still have, doing it. He is still at it. Do, uh, have you ever, on these postings in, in these countries, have you ever felt in danger for your life? The only time I felt, uh, I felt worried was in Somalia in March, I guess, of 1993 when there were anti-U.S. demonstrations by Adid. And I debated whether I should stay in my own little compound or whether I should move into the military base. And I finally decided I was going to stay where I was, but I sent someone around to see Adid to say, you take particular care. And I sent one of my officers and one of the military officers, because if anything happens to me, uh, you and all your people are going to pay a very heavy price. In fact, uh, the trouble went away. But I have not felt personally endangered, although in Vietnam, uh, Somalia, and other places, there were plenty of opportunities. Things can happen, but then you can get hit by a truck on downtown Washington. Or Shreveport. Or Shreveport, Sir, that's right. Uh, Somalia, now 
distance and time, and I know that you've had an opportunity to think about it, lecture on it, etc., teach it. What 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 is your assessment now about when we went in there and so on? What how, how does Ambassador Oakley look upon it night in this year? Well, I look upon it first. The United States and others missed an opportunity to help the Somalis pull themselves together before three or four hundred thousand people had died of starvation as a result of famine and uh, civil war by late 1982. We missed the opportunity earlier on. The United States was among the leaders in early 1992 saying we don't want to touch this situation. By October, November, somewhere between three and four hundred thousand people had died and unless there was going to be a quick massive intervention nothing was going to save another 500,000 people from dying. And so I think President Bush made the right decision, and we carried it out in the right way. And the Marine generals and I had shared experiences in Lebanon and in Vietnam, and we were careful not to get in too deep. And we didn't want to make enemies out in the local warlords. We didn't want to allow them to keep all their power, but we wanted to whittle them down gradually and see some return of civilian influence to government and see the war come to an end. And we were on our way to doing that, but the time came for the United States to surrender the leadership to the United Nations. And we had a new administration here in Washington. Uh, President Clinton had his views on what to do, much more idealistic, if you will, but at the same time much more unrealistic than President Bush, who had a lot of experience, and his national security team had a lot of experience. Therefore, the United Nations, with the support of the United States, engaged upon something that was much more intrusive in Somalia and began to impose our own values and thereby made some enemies. And the same thing happened there that had happened 10 years earlier in Lebanon, when unexpectedly uh, the political course we were on produced a military explosion which hurt us badly and then we had to reverse course. And so I think that part of it is very sad. Uh, but again, it was the best of intentions. We just overreached, if you will, the U.S. and the United Nations. And the Somalis, once all these passions were reignited, uh, have gone back to what they were before, and the world has said, sorry, there's not much we can do. As long as you're going to fight with each other, we can't help you very much. What kind of man was Adid? Adid is a very clever, very ambitious man. Uh, he's a man that can be reasoned with. Uh, I always felt that Adid was sort of schizophrenic. He had a sensible side and he had a uh, wild side, and he has people around him who feed uh, both of these. And uh, we tried to work with the people who were sensible and to work on his good side and contain his bad side, if you will, and uh, we had some success. But later on, it just became intolerable. Uh, he felt he was being whittled down, and he felt that he was being marginalized, and he felt that he was being attacked or was about to be attacked, and so he decided to fight back. And the way it, and the way it developed, you see, because he's a very clever, cunning man, uh, he turned everybody to his side because it appeared to be Somalis against the outside world and a uh, question of nationalism. And uh, so he got everybody on his side, uh, which is most unfortunate. And that reignited the Civil War, and the Civil War is still going on. And uh, not at the same scale, because you don't find uh, tens of thousands of Somalis dying, but it's not a very healthy situation. Sir, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. How can one put an ambassador on the spot? You've gotten out of spots for 35 years. Who's the best Secretary of State, who, as far as you were concerned, for this country? Well, it's hard to say. Uh, different secretaries of state for different times, if you will. Uh, I had a lot of admiration for different ones. Uh, Kissinger, Vance, uh, Schultz, and uh, Baker, uh, all four, in different ways, I think, were very, very fine secretaries of state. Uh, I think Dr. Kissinger, surprisingly, uh, cared more about the Foreign Service in a way and did more for it, uh, even though he appeared to disdain them. Uh, nevertheless, he used uh, oh, senior Foreign Service officers uh, in a better way than some of the others had. Uh, Secretary Baker uh, managed some very important policies through successfully, such as the reintegration of uh, Germany and getting us out of uh, Central America, but uh, at the same time, the State Department as a whole has not fared as well. Uh, the Foreign Service has not fared as well. And uh, it's losing influence and losing a lot of its good people, which I think is too bad because this is the time when we need understanding of the world even more than we have before. 
And uh, the best which the Foreign Service can offer is a real understanding of foreign countries so that you can look at everything, trade, human rights, politics, uh, military, uh, investment, uh, all these issues at the same time and figure out how best to achieve U.S. interests, where your priorities lie, what you emphasize now, what you emphasize later. And pulling it all together is where the Foreign Service uh, is the best, and uh, that's why I think it's an important institution, and I hate to see it go downhill. Sir, uh, among the presidents uh, under whom you've served, who do you felt was uh, the most knowledgeable and, and the best president, strictly from a foreign affairs, foreign relations standpoint? I guess it's a toss-up uh, between President Nixon and uh, President Bush, uh, frankly. They had different styles, very different styles. Uh, Nixon was much more secretive, Bush was much more open, but both of them took a great deal of interest in foreign affairs and both of them were very, very good. I think that Nixon in some ways was bolder. On the other hand, I think that uh, Bush was probably more consistent. Uh. The, uh, the forces that Bush put together uh, for the Gulf War, that was quite an extraordinary feat, wasn't it, getting all of those diverse elements to come together? Exactly. Maybe one of the, one of the great feats of American. It was, and uh, he and Secretary of State Baker and Secretary of Defense Cheney and uh, General Powell, who was the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, worked as a team. And later on, that same teamwork, of course, helped us do the job in Somalia the first time, uh, the first phase of it, uh, very, very well. But it was an extraordinary event. Combining, com combining diplomacy with military force. And uh, on the ground, uh, getting everybody to work together was indeed an extraordinary feat. And, uh, but it just shows Bush's experience. And remember, uh, he'd had all those years as Reagan's vice president and yeah. the CIA, and uh, his team had worked Ambassador together. Ambassador to China himself. That's right. That's right. Uh, when you see these trouble spots now, when you read about them in the Washington Post, does the uh, heart ever beat a little quicker and you kind of wish you were packing the bags and taking off? Is, is there a, a yearning for the action? I guess that's what I'm asking. Yeah, there is, uh, but, you know, you have to uh, realize that there's a time and a place for everything, and uh, I think I was pretty well suited for that particular time and that particular place, uh, Somalia, because of my previous experience there and my working with the military. Uh, it just depends, uh, but I think you have to be very, very careful because intervening prematurely or intervening without understanding the country that you're moving into and the consequences of what you're going to do can blow up in your face, and that would have been better off if you hadn't gone in in the first place for everybody, the United States and for the world and for the people in, uh, in that country. But I occasionally get asked for advice, and I'm glad to give gratuitous advice since I'm no longer responsible for my decisions, but uh, <laughs> uh, sometimes, yeah, the heart does beat a little bit. You're right. What is the next trouble spot that you see on the horizon where it, the blip isn't obvious yet on the screen? What, what, what's the next possible trouble spot that we should be looking to? Well, depends on what type of trouble spot you're looking for. Over the long run, uh, I think that we're going to have an important uh, issue to confront that is U.S.-Russian relations, just like we have to confront U.S.-Chinese relations. And these are two huge, powerful countries. Russia seems to be on the decline temporarily. Uh, China's on the upsurge, but Russia is still a great country. We were there just, I was there just last week. And I think that uh, in both countries, there are a lot of new people who don't understand each other very well. When a new situation, they're not quite sure where we're going, and we for sure don't know where they're going because they don't either. They don't either. Uh, so we have to be very, very careful and not jump to hasty conclusions and realize that we have to go through a few rough spots, as we do with the Chinese, but we have to maintain contact because there's no need for either country uh, to end up in a confrontation with the United States. Ambassador Oakley, you, you've been a pleasure to interview. Uh, it takes a little out of the interviewer. You, uh, uh, you must be marvelous at your work, and uh, I want you to know how very much we thank you and have been honored uh, that you've joined us here today. Well, it's been a real pleasure for me because uh, Louisiana is my love. Thank you. Thank you, sir.
Louisiana Legends is made possible by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana. This important program series enables us to discover, through the accomplishments of our fellow Louisianians, the unique character of a state so proudly served by Blue Cross and Blue Shield of Louisiana for 60 years. For a copy of this program, call 1-800-973-7246 or send 1995 to Louisiana Legends, care of Louisiana Public Broadcasting, 7860 Anselmo Lane, Baton Rouge, Louisiana, 70810. Please allow four to six weeks for delivery.